Welcome to Sticky Interviews. This is Making Business Matter MBM, the home of Sticky Learning and the trainer of soft skills to the UK retail and manufacturing industry, helping them to increase profits and sales. This interview series is all about speaking to great thinkers and sharing ideas to make that happen. And today, We've got Mish Bondesio with us. I hope I pronounced that right. I never checked the pronunciation of your last name, Mish. I do apologise if that's horrifically wrong. Um, talking to us today. Thanks very much for being here, Mish. I'm just going to give the guys a quick rundown of who you are, where you come from, and I'm going to get into these questions, okay? So okay. the first thing is that Mish is a business performance mentor with a background in communications and project management. Her growth sessions, mentoring programs, workshops and talks support businesses, people to build healthier cultures and develop more mindful approaches to work, which we all need in this day and age before this and after this. Originally from South Africa, Mish is currently based in the Northwest UK. Her clients are consultants, solopreneurs and small teams working in creative and digitally focused sectors around the world, mostly in the creative space as far as I'm aware at this point in time. Mish, thanks very much for being here. Thanks for inviting me. It was huge that we started to have a bit of a get to know you, which had nothing to do with this interview series. And as that conversation developed and kind of sprouts came out of it, and I was just like, some of the stuff that you're talking about is absolutely vital for people to be hearing from a mental health point of view, from an isolation point of view, which we're all in right now. We're in, I think the majority of people are just starting week three. I know I we, we're a week before that because our work started to slow down, the face-to-face -face work started to slow down a little bit. Um, so we've been isolating for, this will be the beginning of week four. And as we were talking about that, you were just saying there's, some, there's some, going to be some critical crunch points that come up through this that you're kind of aware of. And I just thought, you know what, we've got to share this. We've got to give this to people in the workspace and they need to hear what you've got to say about this uh, to support those consultants and those, uh, sorry, the, the culture that's coming up out of this. So first of all, thank you, as I just said, please tell everyone what you do and why you do it. So as you mentioned, I'm a communications consultant and business performance mentor, and I want to help people to develop more mindful approaches to work because for the past 20 years, I've worked in high pressure deadline driven environments and industries and sectors, which have very unsupportive work cultures. And I've also experienced burnout firsthand and my burnout was so epic that I was unable to work for more than a year. So I have firsthand experience of being socially isolated and very unwell and not having a work environment that was supportive of my recovery during that point. So I realized actually that we need to be helping others to build their resilience, develop the skills that they need to work better whilst supporting their well-being, because it's all very closely tied. There's a lot of research out there that shows that better selves are better for business. They're better for your bottom line. And if you were humans first and resources second, essentially. So if you put humans at the center of your business, they're going to be better for your business. I love that because I'm guilty of doing it in the past as well. We are humans first before we are resources. The bit that I'm mindful from of a, of a leadership point of view is making sure that we get a balance of both of those. Like you say, you know, people first. So how that links in for me is actually these are human beings what are their needs what are their wants what are their desires what you know what support do they need what training do they need um, how can we help them do that and then helping them to see where they're going and the, because we can see what they're capable of and the skills they've got we can then see how they move across the chessboard of of, of business in the nicest possible but then move into their strengths and Great. i've often referred to people in business it's like a game of chess and some people are knights and some people are bishops and some people are kings and queens or whatever. But if you try and move a bishop the same way as you move a knight, you're going to get some serious resistance from your, the people around you. Correct. Um, so like you say, it's making sure that they are supported so that actually they feel like they're, they're working optimally. And that leads to more engagement and loyalty to the company as well. You know? So they will bring their whole selves to work and they'll give you 110% because they feel supported and they feel safe within the environment that they're in to deliver their best. Absolutely. And I know the, we, I know there's plenty of people around here that band these numbers around, you know, 87% of people are not engaged in the work that they're doing. And it's leading, leading to millions and billions of pounds, or, 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 or pounds, I think even in the UK, it's 84 billion, I think, of lost productivity 
um, due to some of these situations. But if you're not feeling productive and you're not feeling like you're contributing, you won't do your best work. And if you go to somewhere that you just genuinely feel unhappy about and, um, and you're unsupported in that, burnout is an absolute given for sure. Yeah. Amazing. But then you also talked about that self-isolation piece. How I mean, it's a personal event for you. So I'm gonna, how much are you happy to share about that you know, in, in what you do? I'm perfectly, I'm happy to share as much as I need to. Um, actually sharing is, was part of the last step of the recovery process for me. So I think it's important for people to know why I'm doing what I'm doing now because it had such a profound effect on, on my life. So I'm happy to share. Um, through that process of burnout, I kind of rediscovered myself I developed the skills I needed to, to support myself better in both working and living. I discovered the importance of solitude as a form of self-awareness and as a way to actually help you develop all of those ideas that we have inside our head, but we never get a chance to, to actually <laughs> think about or do something about. Um, and I also uh, I discovered that I had far more resilience than I thought I did. And this is an important thing for all of us to know is that we do have resilience within us to cope with highly stressful situations. We just need to know how to bring it out. We need to know what to do in certain situations. So I finding that in this situation, yes, it's scary. Yes, it can be anxiety inducing. It can be create a lot of fearfulness within us. But if we have the skills that we, and toolkit that we can call on to support us when we're feeling that way, then we can get through it a lot more easily. We feel a lot less paralyzed. We feel a lot less uncertain because we've got the skills to look inward to find that certainty. Thank you. And I do a lot of work inside workplace stress, anxiety, and depression. I've suffered with that horrendously myself. I've worked through it. You talk about that resilience to push through it. Yes, you can still get through it. It doesn't make it easier. And eventually that stuff starts to kind of, you, you can start to kind of weather you and wear you down. And then eventually something happens. The key part, as you know, talked about, is everyone has that resilience. The, the bit that I often see with people is, especially from the workplace, the, what we call the normal workplace anxieties and depressions, is, you know, I have a problem. I feel like this. Everyone else looks like they're okay, therefore I don't say anything in case I look like I am the problem or causing a problem. And we keep quiet. And because of that keeping quiet, we start to put a, a lid on things and the pressure builds up. And, to, and, and we put all these coping mechanisms in place, you know, whatever it is for me, it used to be drinking too much coffee, um, you know, or overworking. And then something happens and then you fall down. And you know, no one copes their way out of a crisis. You know, you don't manage yourself out. You know, you have to take the lead on that. Mm -hmm. But then as you are going back through what you're saying, that developing ideas, having the, the solitude and quiet to develop those ideas and come up with new, um, with a creativity that actually helps to improve where you're at. Correct. We're all capable of creativity. We're just not aware of it, you know, but creativity needs a little bit, sometimes a bit of a constraint can help, but it also needs space and time. And very often our modern workplace does not allow for that because we are constantly on and we're multitasking, even though that's not something that our brain can do. And we're working in a digital sphere where everything around us works faster than our brain does. So we're actually the weakest link and we're trying to keep up all the time. Yeah. No, it, the other thing you're talking about the creativity is the amount of times that I hear people say that they are not creative. Absolute misnomer. You're, you're a human being. First and foremost, you're a human being and you are a creative creature. Everything you do is a creation. The fact that I'm creating a sound using air coming out and going past my vocal cords is creating something. Um, when I cook a meal for my, I'm creating a meal for my family. When I'm doing these interviews, I'm creating a space to share ideas. And we all do this. We're all creative in different ways. Some of us are creative as car mechanics or painters and decorators or cooks, mm. whatever. And the moment we start thinking like that, well, actually, what else can I do with this creative thinking? What else can I do with my, my spare time? You know, what else can I do in this leadership space? What else can I do with this project that I'm working on and come up with the new solutions? But like you say, having that quiet space to actually develop the idea um, and then being able to put it out there. Mm -hmm. Super important. 
go, go, go. So. Indeed. Indeed, I was just going to say in a work situation, often I was, things are busy all the time and there isn't time for deep work because you expect it to be always on and, and available and contactable and responding to things immediately. And that is not conducive necessarily for creative space and for creative thinking. So in a workspace, that's part of what I do in terms of encouraging healthier cultures is creating different types of work styles for different types of work and you know, allowing that space for the creativity to come out. Amazing. I've got family that work in the creative space and I'm aware, even from my own, from creating training content and, and doing certain events, that I need to have a time to doodle and have a time to you know, to to research and have a time to not do that and then have a time to then come back to it. But like you say, the modern workspace is nine till five thirty with no lunch break because you eat your lunch at your desk. And if you're at your desk, you're considered working, so you get interrupted you know, every five minutes yeah. and all that stuff. But you're just going from the meeting to this to that project, and it's someone else's idea which you're interacting on, but not being creative in those in those uh, in those spaces. It's more an expectation than anything. Yeah, but then what happens is that we don't get our work done during the day because we're constantly in meetings. So we end up working when we get home. So we're still on and we're still contactable. And if people are sending us emails at night, we're responding to emails at night. So the workday never ends. And actually, that's really bad for our rest and recovery and for you know our creative thinking because our brain needs to rest in order to be able to produce the ideas. So there's a lot of bad habits being created um, and behaviors in term because we're always on and because, you know, there's a war in our attention. There's information coming at us all the time from lots of different places. There is a war on our attention. You're bloody right there is. Um, I'm mindful. I'm not sure who's going to be listening to it. I'm mindful of my language. <laughs> you know, I, I, I talked about this in, in the, the live stream I did just now, the, the webinar. Um, is I sent an email last night because it's just something popped in my head. So I sent the email. And I, I knew I had an hour booked out to do some work on a Sunday night just to make sure I was ready for Monday morning. That's, you know, I penciled that in. The rest of the day was spent out sunshine doing personal work. I sent the email expecting not to get a response back until Monday morning, but had a response back in five minutes. So I know that people are sitting there with their phones and with their laptops because they're home working right now, or whatever it is. Yeah. And they're, they're potentially using blue screens quite quite close to their own sleeping time so like you say they're not actually yeah. switching off they're constantly giving themselves that deluge of blue screen of, of that irritant yeah. to the to the brain stimulus so if they do go to sleep it's taking longer to get to the places they need to in their sleep to actually process uh, and recalibrate that creative thinking that comes from dreaming that i know we need Correct. I mean, the melatonin impact, the impact on our melatonin and our sleep hormones means that it's not just about struggling to get to sleep. It's about how we can stay asleep and the quality of the sleep that we have, because it's not just REM sleep that we need. It's the other sleep that we need, too, because they all perform different functions and processes that support our brain's well-being. And then on top of that, there's also cortisol, the other hormone that gets stimulated by all of the negative news that's coming at us when we're looking at Twitter in bed and so forth, you know. And so that's raising our stress levels and anxiety levels. That's also impacting on the quality of our sleep and our sense of well-being. And so, yeah, I mean, I really advocate for strong morning and evening routines. You might not be able to control the rest of your day, but if you start your day and you end your day well, both of those are really supportive of helping you during your work day and it's all connected with your sleep both of those routines support you up for sleep um, support you for sleep and help you to wake earlier in the morning as well or ready ready in the morning to take on your day great and it's interesting you said about the the news um being so negative there's a lot of stuff going on yeah we need to be updated yeah. but at the same time it's producing cortisol because it's causing a stress reaction in us and if you're watching Correct. the news at 10 which is probably the worst time to watch the news. A, you're watching the TV. B, you're watching it late at night, which is pumping your cortisol, which is then making it more difficult to get to sleep. And the sleep you're getting is not the right quality because you're not dropping through those stages. Yeah. And cortisol is actually a beneficial hormone. And we know it is because it helps you to wake up, which is yeah. what I found out recently. Um, but having it in your system when you're trying to go to sleep is not giving you that beneficial sleep you need. Yeah. So... Word, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna switch my from coaching interview hat to clear out, you know, trainer mentor mode, stop watching the 10 o'clock news, it's not <laughs> good for you, it's okay, it will still be there till tomorrow, um, and it will help improve your sleep, I promise. Um, what other things can people do um, 
to really thrive in self-isolation. You've got, you've got some great experiences in this. So what is it and what are the key things you took away that helped you to thrive in this? Sure. So there's three things. Two are more personal and one is more work focused. Firstly, I would say building strong self-care foundations because we need to support our body to support our brain. And these are little habits that we can look at focusing on. This is, we've spoken about good sleep habits, nutrition, regular movement, mindfulness and meditation, being conscious of our breathing. And lastly, practicing loving kindness, which is all about self-esteem and the language that we use when we describe ourselves in the mirror or to somebody else and to all those impressionable people around us who might take on what we're saying in that negative way. All of those little things are so important uh, to support our health and well-being and our productivity and performance. The second aspect we should be focusing on is around, we may be socially distancing. I actually prefer to call it physically distancing. Um, we need to seek sociability online or in any way that we can, because one of the big things we're dealing with in self-isolation is loneliness and isolation. And both of those have a really negative impact on our physical and mental health. So what can we do to stay connected and to feel like we're a part of a community? And then the third aspect that I would focus on is around your habits to do with work. Um, we are now all, most of us are being forced to work remotely. And for some of us, this might be something we're very accustomed to. But for people who are new to it, what they may be trying to do is transpose their work day and their work routines as they currently were onto their home life. And they can't do that um, because now there are partners that need to be looked after, pets, children need to be educated, there's laundry that needs to be done. There's a whole lot of other responsibilities that factor in. So our, we have to create new routines. We have to create new systems and rituals for how we work, which means that we can't be necessarily available nine to five. We may be working outside of normal work times, but what that also means is we're not necessarily available outside of work times. It's when we can get the work done. As long as we're doing the work and we're showing up, you know, and we're getting the work done, it doesn't really matter that we're not necessarily available at 11 o'clock when you send that email. So it's about changing our communication styles as well. And I'm probably going to have to work through each of those sections, but I'm going to work on that point that you just raised there in... And it's also about setting the expectations for it. And we're, we're all Correct. working differently. It's not necessarily that we're all working Monday to Friday, nine to five. Well, actually, we've got the homeschooling situation. Maybe mm -hmm. we have to work in different shifts. Maybe we start earlier, but we have longer lunch breaks. Maybe we start earlier and finish early, whatever it is. But mm -hmm. making sure that we're talking to our bosses, our managers or whatever, so that they know what hours, work, that they can see the plan, so they know that when we're going to come back to them. So they you know it's frustration is caused by what we think and I had the expectation we have in our head and reality not matching that. Correct. So when I think so-and-so is doing this job and they're not doing it, act, then I become frustrated because we're not, we're not, those, those two elements aren't meeting. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. So I think it's, you know, in this situation, it's very important for teams to together set the expectations for how and when they work. And then have regular check-ins, but not leaders shouldn't be micromanaging because if they're constantly checking in and expecting a response, that person's not going to get that work done if they're being badgered all the time, you know. So it's maybe daily check-ins, a weekly check-in. Also, what's really important in terms of communication is um, asynchronous communication. So what that means is not responding in real time. And this is a very common way of practice uh, of working in tech remote companies where their teams might be spread across various different time zones, which means they're not expected to respond immediately. So what that means is you don't have email open all the time. You don't have Slack open all the time. You don't have every form of communication open all the time with the dings and the pings distracting you from getting the actual work done. So if you can agree on set times where you're going to meet up or respond when an email may come in and maybe it's a case of saying to your, your manager, I work for two hours solid in the morning before I check emails. If it's urgent, please phone me so that I can get that work done. Or, you know, I can't, I'm not contactable between two and four because that's when I'm, I'm in educating mode and I'm the teacher for, for the afternoon. But then it's also about deciding what types and styles of communication are right for different situations. Is it always necessary to have a Zoom meeting when actually a Slack 
a minuted response via Slack could suffice? Is it better to do email in this situation? Because Zoom uh, meetings are very draining in terms of energy. And I've only recently did, found out the reason why is because our brain is practicing cognitive or experiencing cognitive dissonance, dissonance when we are in a Zoom meeting. Because what's happening is we see the presence of somebody but we can't physically feel them. So there's this sense of absence and presence that our brain is constantly kind of battling between. And it takes a lot more energy for us to connect and to make sense of that. So that's why part of the reason why it's so tiring. That's interesting. And I'd heard something recently that to see someone's face is better than to not see them at all. So there's, there's an element, like you said, there's this element of, yes, it is, because I can see the whites of their eyes, but there's also that pull where actually I, I can't, they're not there. Yeah. And then you've got that amplified. So if you've got that on gallery mode on Zoom, so you can see everybody's face, you're seeing a whole group of people and you're constantly <laughs> looking and you're, you're, there's all this different movement of people yeah. doing different things of background, you know, your, and your brain brain's is, taking in all of that stimuli. Exactly that. So you've got yeah. this dissonance from the person speaking who's not physically there. And then you've got, depending on how many people in that Zoom room, um, not in all that m movement, mm. tiring your brain out because your brain's overworking. And the, the kind of flip side of that is, as I discovered myself, I was telling you the other day that I had to minimize um, the images of people so that I could see my presentation. And so I was delivering into a void and I felt like I wasn't being acknowledged because I couldn't see people's responses or how that was landing. But the flip side of that was it made me realize actually when somebody else is delivering something, can they actually see that how, I, how it's affecting me? Do I need to kind of accentuate my responses so that they can see that it's landing? You know, do I need to do more gestures and actually nod more vigorously so that they can be seen and feel heard? So there's a lot more energy going on. You know? yeah. It's a new skill set. And, you know, this is talking to um, another interviewee, Natasha Wallace, um, last week she mentioned that people are getting more tired and i hadn't thought about that myself you know we're all getting tired in the evening because we're not used to the way of working we've got a different yeah. operating rhythm so uh, it is we might be doing the same work but we're doing it in a different space we're doing it with a different schedule a different routine and our brain is still compensating for that you know it's still checking at a, a primordial level in the amygdala is this a threat environment is this safe um, so your brain is, is computing with that and then shifting it back to the habit forming part of your brain to say, this is okay. You can carry on doing your office job in the kitchen and that's okay. But your brain's still trying to work that out. And then it's kind of trying to compute and, and manage your child then coming to ask you questions halfway through a, a project that you're working on. Is this a threat? Are they going to, are they going to eat meals? You know, <laughs> that same computing and it's just tiring out because it's a new operator. And, and you talk about cadence as well, that rhythm. That's right. Know, that is it's that thing you know are we working in a different way um to what we're doing yes we are is this new yes it is and the other thing you know you, you talked about that that physical distancing uh there's a book called uh the lost connections by johan hari yes amazing like revolutionized my way i think about mental health my own mental health and and other elements about it I, it was a phenomenal week made me feel really quite positive about what's being talked about and he talks about the opposite of sobriety. Um, the opposite of, I'm sorry, he says the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's connection. And it's That's the right. need for connection. It's the need to you know, connect with our families in a different way. It's the need to emotionally connect with people around us um, and connect more. Now you talk about social distancing. Actually, we've been social distancing for a very long time in what is actually more like anti-social media. Um, like Facebook, etc. It's not it's not sociable in the majority. Mm. Sociable is actually connecting and talking to people. Sociable is actually getting together with friends, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in reality, whatever. And sociable is actually working with your family unit in at home and the people that you're closest to, and connecting with those people and having meaningful conversations, not just posting drill. Um, Correct. It's like a, it's like an onion, a series of layers of support, you know. And social media actually sits right at the outside of that. And it's not feeding the middle part, or very no. rarely is it feeding the middle part. And then True. you talk about the, the self-care foundation, sleep, we touched on, food, mm -hmm. meditation, love and kindness. I think it's important actually we talk about, I don't think as leaders we talk enough about love and kindness. I do. Um, 
in a kind of fairly pragmatic and direct kind of way. Um, okay. It is as often, you know, it is horses for courses. When I speak to people, it's in a very direct manner and I talk about it, it's very important. I practice it regularly for myself. What one thing would you recommend for people to help them practice love and kindness, especially in this situation? So our brain, we can, we can train our brain to feel positive about something. And it could be as simple as smiling, even when we don't feel good. And maybe it's about having a visualization or an affirmation or a mantra that you get into the habit of saying to uplift your spirits, to be kinder to yourself. So it's, it's about accepting that we're okay where we are, even though we're a work in progress in terms of loving kindness. So at the, at the moment, we might be feeling, I'm not working enough. I'm not being enough of a good parent because I feel like I'm being split all over the place because this crisis is demanding too much of me. I don't know what to do, but you know what? I'm going to be okay. I'll take one step at a time. I can figure this out. Um, one of the important things that I learned as part of my recovery was that there is always another way to do whatever it is you need to do. There is always another way. So if you haven't got the answer, keep looking. There's always another way. And in terms of the positivity aspect that I was saying, you know, you can, if you're having to develop new habits that you're finding quite tricky in the beginning, like learning how to use Zoom and it's a bit disorientating and, and there's a lot that is new to you and it feels stressful. If you tell yourself that it's exciting and that this is fun, it might not sound like it is or might not feel like it is to start. But if you keep doing that and you keep registering that so with a smile, your brain starts realizing this is fun. And then it starts identifying it as fun. And then it starts becoming easier. You know? Exactly that. And you talk about shifting physiology. So yeah. sometimes if you force yourself to smile, you know, you try and have a negative thought while you're smiling. It's pretty much impossible. Your face changes. So when you start to smile, it starts to shift. And then the other way, if you think about, you know, your cat or your children at the, the Christmas play or whatever, you're going to think about it. It's going to force you to smile because it feels good. So yeah. kind of, it's, it's almost like a chicken and egg scenario that you can force one to happen with the other. Um, it's true. And you were talking earlier about um, creativity and the importance of playing. And that's a really good way to lift your spirits and to feel more positive as well. You know, when we go into play mode, we let go of all of those other constraints and we're just in the moment and we're a lot more mindful. And if you've got children, schedule more time to play. Yes. Uh, and our daughter, we homeschool anyway. So we're fairly used to this. This is a new level of intensity because we haven't got forest school. We haven't got the yoga classes, all those things. But at the same time is we're making sure that we schedule in every single day a, an arts and crafts session. So it That's might be great. stuff that she got bought for Christmas and either my wife Anna will be doing this with her on Saturday. We were making a life-sized sea turtle out of cardboard and painting it. And, you know, and I'll probably not share pictures about this on the, on the YouTube. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's just coming up with new ideas and doing this stuff. I'm just going to paint. And I realized that I was still in, in doing that. I still realized that I was carrying some tension from work. And I was kind of getting frustrated with certain elements because they were working. You know, I was frowning. I was doing the serious face, which I often do when I'm working. I was like, hold on a minute. I'm painting a giant sea turtle with my seven-year-old daughter i need to kind of just breathe that out let it go and just be in the moment of painting a sea turtle yeah uh, and, and doing that stuff and like i say just allowing that creativity to come just so i can relax and unwind and do a different day um massively important i wanted to expand on what you said though on, on there around kind of coming up with those, those those ideas of looking for that excitement a teacher of mine once taught me when you're in, a, in a, a serious situation, you can just ask the question, what's funny about this moment that I haven't noticed yet? And there is always something about it. If you just change the angle which you're looking at it, you can then start to ask questions and go, well, what's funny about this that I haven't noticed yet? And try and find something that does make you laugh or try and make you laugh or something that makes you laugh about an element or a person that's involved in this situation that you remember from the past. Oh, yeah, and just to change that physiology just enough so you can get a new idea and move you forward. Correct. And that, that harks back to the idea of self-awareness and in the busy world that we now live in, and this was before the crisis happened, but it's even, it's been exacerbated as a result of it. There's so much that's demanding our attention. As I said, there's a war on attention. Our attention is being split in lots of different ways. We are living in a culture of cortisol because there's things constantly 
raising our level of anxiety. And what that gives rise to is autopilot behaviors because there's too much going on for us to make conscious decisions about things. So we kind of default to the automatic response, which quite often is tied to detrimental habits. You know, they don't, they're not as supportive as they potentially could be. So that it's practicing that self-awareness so that you bec become more aware of, hang on, I've responded in a certain way. Why am I responding that way? Being able to question that, being able to reflect on it. As you said, you know, what's a different way of looking at this or what's funny about this situation? All of that requires being able to snap out of the autopilot mode and into the conscious mind, mindful mode. Yeah. And that takes practice. Huge amounts of practice yeah. and a certain amount of accept, not acceptance is the wrong word, acknowledgement that your brain is doing it first of all. Correct. Yeah. You can't stop it from happening. You can only become aware of it happening. Yeah. You become aware of it and you go, oh, I'm going to do something different. Uh, yeah. MBM, we, we talk about learning to learn. So we teach people how to learn first and foremost. And um, one of the things, you know, kind of, they talk about habit stacking. So if you're yeah. doing a certain habit, you can then build on that and remember certain things to help improve your learning. The other side of it is, though, is almost doing the opposite of things. So go to work a different way. Brush your teeth with the other hand. Yeah, yeah. Doing those things. And you get to a certain point in your life where you're actually, not only do you have a favorite mug, and I guarantee anyone that listening to this has a favorite mug, yeah? And then they will go and find that mug if it's not there, just to check if it's clean or not so they can use it, yeah? <laughs> and even worse than that, when we get to a certain point, I, I bet you have a favorite hob on your cooker as well that you use, yeah? So, and it's ridiculous things like this. I'm like, hold on a minute. 95% of my day-to-day -day was exactly the same as it was yesterday. So you become aware of it. And if you want to kind of create that, that neural plasticity to kind of help m make a change, do something a little bit differently just to give you a nudge. Oh, actually, I can do something different here. I can change the way that I'm looking at this. I can be kind to myself, regardless of what I think happened before. Or, you know, I can change the way that I work that makes me feel better at the end of the day, even yeah. in isolation. And that's why it's important to start small, because if you try and make radically big changes, you're not going to stick with them because this whole idea of we spoke previously about work-life balance being an unhelpful term or phrase because balance is a static concept. It doesn't move. And we're essentially setting ourselves up to fail if we're trying to achieve balance because everything around us is moving. So that's why cadence is so much more important. But if we want to achieve that sense of cadence, what that means is being okay with the fact that we may have rituals and routines that we try and implement in our day, but they need to be kind of flexible because things happen and we have to react to those or respond to those. So being open to the fluctuations in our day, you know, rather than feeling like we have to stick with something. And it's that rigidity and that holding on that is holding us back. So you talk yeah. about kind of that balancing. Whenever anyone ever says to me balance, it always takes me back to the end of the original Italian job with Michael Caine. And they've just robbed the Italian bank or whatever it is, and they're whizzing around the mountainside. And at the end, they've got the gold in the back of the bus and the bus swings off and goes over the edge of the cliff and it's just teetering on an edge. <laughs> and you've got the gold at one end and then you've got all the guys at the other end and none of them can move so if everyone jumps off the bus the bus goes over the edge because of the gold and if anyone goes for the gold there's not enough weight at the front of the bus to keep the bus on the, and just, life is like this yeah, yeah. Not, obviously not this detrimental but we know that you know in nature nothing is certain there is no security in nature stuff just happens mm -hmm. so if you're constantly trying to balance everything and make sure everything's just like oh, nobody move i've got a plan it's not going to work like that. <laughs> you kind of have to have the flexibility to say, oh, okay, this is coming in. I'm, I did the best that I could with the best that I have. And based on that information, okay, I'll maybe ask a different question that's going to help to shift the direction rather than look for a balance um, and, and keep us moving forward in a progressive kind of way rather than trying to keep everything kind of at some sort of uh, erroneous um, status quo almost. This is why it's important to have strong self-care foundations because it creates a level of certainty for us. We know what we're capable of. We know what it is we can do. There is always going to be uncertainty around us, whether there's a crisis happening or not. So if we can't find certainty externally, we can find certainty internally. Exactly that. We, there is all, we have that choice of reaction. We have the choice to respond how we're going to respond. That's the one thing that we have any control over. And regardless of what's going on around us, and I can't remember the poem, but you know, everything's chaotic around us. The one thing that we have choice about, as you said, is that certainty internally, beautifully put. Um, massive advocate of that.
So we've looked at in there self-care foundation. We've looked at look at that love and <coughs> kindness that we're holding to ourselves, that physical distancing, making sure we're staying connected as well with people around us. And we looked at the work routines and making sure we've got that cadence and that operating rhythm that you and I talk about um, when we speak into that. Amazing. It's not a huge value in that already. A couple of things I wanted to talk about. Yeah. I talked I talk to you before a little bit about digital well-being. And when I went and Googled it, all it came up with was an app um, that teaches you digital well-being, which in itself is almost an oxymoron, I think, if that's the right term. You know, it's an online app for helping to teach you digital well-being. So by being online, it's kind of keeping you in the loop. Keeping you online even more. <laughs> all more. So to you, what is digital well-being? For me, I think it's about being aware of how, when, and why we use our digital tools and the impact that they have on our health and well-being and productivity. And by tools, I mean everything from our hardware, like our laptops and our tablets and our phones, to our software, to the apps we use, to, the, to TV and to streaming apps like Netflix, for example. Anything that we are engaging with that is electronic, that is technical in nature, and that we use to fulfill work and life practices. And with, when it comes to well-being, what happens is that when we're not using them in a way that is supportive, it gives rise to anxiety and depression. It affects our concentration, our focus, our attention span. We are becoming permanently distracted, so we can't complete lengthy tasks. We can't have a conversation with anybody because we have become, it's, it's become automatic that we reach for our phones. It's become an extension of our hand. It's like a pacifier or a comfort blanket. And uh, there is a, actually even um, a phobia that has been named after it called nomophobia, which is the fear of being without your phone. It gives rise to anxiety. And this is where we're at. So we actually need to be conscious of the impact that it has. We need to be aware of what we need to use our tools for and how the best way is that we can interact with them in a way that still supports our health and well-being. Amazing. You touched on some stuff and ideas were coming, coming to my head what you were talking about <laughs> earlier. is that connection piece, though. You know, that fear of, of not having your phone, that addiction to having your phone. It, yeah. An addiction is an addiction. It doesn't matter if it's your phone, gambling, sex, alcohol, drugs, whatever. Addiction is addiction. In that, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection as i mentioned earlier yeah and we as a family went and spent some i have an allotment i'm an avid vegetable grower we love doing this so we went okay. down there for the day um and i didn't touch my phone once for six hours i didn't even think about it and actually to be honest i probably didn't even need to take my phone with me because the, the most immediate people were next to me anyway um you know and that time i was doing the um painting the sea turtle when it's not finished yet we still have to put it together you know i didn't touch my phone because i was with my family and like yeah. I say, you know, it's, 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 for me, it's doing those things that feel good where you can lose yourself in, in time and space, doing what you enjoy doing that connects you heart and soul to, to who you are and where you are, whether that's a family member or an activity, Correct. Or something that creates that, 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 that is of, of purpose, that is purposeful, that creates that feeling. Um, and anything that tech is, you know, is going to create a barrier to that and it's going to create... And even a, a discomfort in talking to someone. Oh, you know, I'll put my phone there and if someone comes in, it just gives me an excuse to check my phone you know, because I don't feel comfortable having this conversation. Yeah. But you need to be communicating, especially now, which is what I love, you know, certain elements of this is, is forcing the communication, is forcing the conversation to happen in a different way. True. Why, to you, why is digital well-being important then? Well, when I was going through my burnout and recovery, um, I found that my digital tools were both a help and a hindrance. So they were an opportunity for me to connect with the outside world, but they were also provided a view into other people's so-called perfect lives through social media, which made me feel worse about my own because I wasn't in a healthy or good place at the time. And we're seeing this quite a lot, particularly with young people who don't, aren't necessarily emotionally equipped to deal with the experience or the feelings that they're encountering when they feel like their life is not perfect enough or they can't achieve what somebody else has. Um, so that's from a social media perspective. But I think that digital well-being with your tools is important as well because we're going to be spending, I mean, even before the crisis, the future trend was that we're going to be spending more time online. 
more time in a digital world. So that means more impacts on our brain and on our body. And as knowledge workers who are working in the online space, our brain is our number one asset. So we really need to look after it in every way possible. Um, I can't remember the exact stat, but I think it was something like your brain uses 20% of all the energy that you're putting into it. I could be wrong with that, but it's a huge I think that's correct. In yeah. comparison to the rest of your body, is using 20% of the energy you're putting in there. Now, when you yeah. talk about that, and we're not equipped to deal with this stuff, my daughter says to me, Dada, when can I have a phone? She's seven years old. She, she sees us with phones. She sees other people with phones. I get this. I use um, social media and platforms as part of my business, my own personal business, as well as connecting with you guys on the laptop with for the interviews. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, so what mama, what's mama said about this? And mama said maybe I don't know, 10, whatever the age was. And I said, okay, well, and she said, what do you think? And I said, well, do you know what age the human brain stops developing? She's seven, so you know, occasionally I, I like to drop these things in there at an early age. And she went, no. And I said, 24. And, I, and she was like, so you want me to wait until I'm 24 till I have a mobile phone? And she's like, bear in mind, she's only seven. And I said, in the, the, in the scientific viewpoint, yes, because I want your brain to fully evolve and develop at the rate it's meant to without pushing these chemicals in at these levels mm -hmm. so that it, it grows the way it should do. I'm also aware that there's a necessity to be tech savvy. And there is a, there's a journey that we go through as, as, as developing human beings where we're exploring and we need some of those tools to explore because the new world is going to involve this. So it's about having the right mixes for that. As we yeah. get older, I think it's then making sure we've got the routine in place. So this is tech time. This is green time, whatever it is, meditation time, nature time, away time, without the phone, you know, the Wi-Fi switched off, zero distraction, time with the right people, including yourself to make that stuff work. I agree. And with your children, you know, whatever age you decide is appropriate for them to have a phone, I think it's about educating them on the pitfalls and the dangers of being online as well. Really, really important. I mean, this has come up a lot recently with Zoom and there are a lot of children who are having meetups on Zoom, but they don't necessarily have the right security settings in place and people trolls are joining zoom groups and they're sharing inappropriate content and they're you know these are things that kids need to be aware of they're a lot more tech savvy than we give them credit for so they're open to this but if they're aware of the dangers and they know what to look out for to stay safe that's the most important thing and then it's also about setting those good examples as a family as you say you know having time for tech having time for play without having time for family time where we're doing activities with each other that do not involve any kind of device you just answered a question for me because this morning I went to arrange a Zoom call uh, interview with another uh, interviewee for next week and they said, password. I couldn't switch the thing that was saying I had to have a password on there. So presuming <coughs> Zoom has now switched on so it's password only to stop these things from happening. That might be the case, but um, I've, there's a very good uh, blog post that I read on Friday by WordFence, which is a security app that I use on my WordPress site. And um, I'm happy to share it with you. It's got a lot of very uh, simple uh, settings that you can change in your account to support security. Super important, especially with children. And I've heard yeah. some horrendous stories of, like I say, trolls in certain situations, um, even hacking into the um, video monitors of babies and stuff. Um, and basically some horrendous person hurling abuse at the child. But thankfully, the child in, in the nice, thankfully, this child was actually deaf when they found this situation out. So the child couldn't actually hear what was being said and just slept through the whole thing. Um, but no, had it That's been another horrendous. child, before, yeah, before they got to that sort of security understanding, then it could have had really detrimental impacts to that child. Not okay. Yeah. The other That's thing okay. you, um, you mentioned I picked up on is that zero tech time. We have a rule in our house we don't have phones at the table unless it's a particular emergency or situation you know we come to the dinner table we sit as a family we eat dinner there are no phones there are no laptops there is we don't have the radio on or anything like that we connect at that time and we, we talk to each other and we have questions so it's important that we're setting that as as meal times as part of our routine and our ritual as part of our operating rhythm yeah. and and zero tech in that space to interrupt as well and there's an important um, thing there as well. When you're eating, when you slow down and you're having conversation, it actually stimulates your digestive process. So it's an important part of slowing things down and giving your body enough time for your gut to send the hormones to your brain to tell it that it's not hungry anymore. But when we are on our phones and we're in those autopilot mode, we're eating too fast. We're not taking cognizance of 
and that's why we end up eating more than we want or we finish dinner and then we dive straight into the chocolate or the snacks because we don't realize that we're full yet that is a really interesting point and i hadn't thought about it that way around because i'm aware that as hunter gatherers when you see the apple tree from the distance you get a dopamine here which encourages you to keep going after the apple tree but whereas if you're on your mobile phone and you're getting a whatsapp thing you're still getting the dopamine here which is keeping you going forward but it's not registering yeah. you've actually got the food which was in front of you and you're messing with your brain chemical levels yeah. that's super interesting so no one like you said then we make poor choices around the snack eating afterwards yeah it all has a knock-on effect um, you know, and there's a lot of research around the, you were saying addiction's addiction, irrespective of what it is you're addicted to. And they found that the physiological effects of our phone addiction are exactly the same as if we were addicted to hard drugs. So the uh, come down when we don't have it, the need for it, that craving, it's all exactly the same. And we get to the point where it becomes automatic because it becomes kind of our brain identifies that, oh, that's something that helps me feel less discomfort that's something that makes me feel safe or makes me feel um, pleasure. So that's what I reach for. And then it becomes automatic. And even though we're not experiencing it anymore and it isn't bringing us joy, we will still reach for it. We will still do that, engage in that behavior. And so it, it becomes so detrimental and negative, but it, they're all small things and we don't, we're not aware of them because we're on autopilot. You then got me thinking about another crack. This, this conversation is <laughs> going in and plenty of directions. Sorry. I read an article and we were talking, they were talking about uh, virtual reality. So um, I can't remember the name of the company, but I think it's Oculus uh, um, virtual reality kits. And then you look at um, Ready Player One, the film, where the majority of the world is plugging into a virtual reality thing and that's what they do with their spare time. And actually it's the same thing. So when yeah. they had people on these virtual reality sets and they were getting them out, they was, they was like they were experiencing a come down. They experience like levels of depression and anxiety when they've been in it yeah. for long periods of time. So as we move forward into the future and we're getting more tech heavy and we're getting then the tech becomes even more immersive because even in the training environment, it becomes more immersive. There are ways that we as trainers, when we're using uh, Microsoft HoloLens or we're using VR and AR to actually deliver content in different ways, we're actually encouraging the use of tech. And it's going to be easier for people to plug into that and be immersed in it. And then when they try and come out and come into the real world, they're going to experience the come down even further. So it's going to be even harder. Thinking and that's about, why the self-care foundations are important because that's what we do to support our body and our brain as part of our rest and recovery through when we're stepping away from those digital tools. And it's got to be that, like you say, it's got to be the foundation. It's got to be in place to make that happen before we go and use the tech. If, and we're doing this with our kids and ourselves, is if we're teaching yeah. them how to use the, the tech first, but not doing the, 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 uh, the foundational work before they go in, you're going to end up with people going into some sort of recovery process to learn some sort of 12 steps or to stop using their mobile phone. Yeah. Whereas actually, if you understand what the foundation is before you go into that, oh, I'm using my tech, but I've already got these good habits over here where I spend time doing this, I go and play in the sandpit, I connect with people, I talk to people, and then I go and use my tech in a thoughtful way, a mindful way. We then don't get the, we don't get the burnouts and the, and the necessity to self-isolate when we have those support mechanisms in place, which is huge. Yeah, correct. And I mentioned earlier about, you know, our brains being our number one asset. And the thing is that we are the weak link in this tech environment that we find ourselves in because our brains can't process things as fast as the technology that we're using. So we will always be behind. We're always trying to keep up. That's why, you know, this rest and recovery periods are so essential as well as to give our bodies, our bodies and our brains time to charge up again and be ready to join the fray again. Mm. Yes. Rest, relax. And like I say, the fray, fighting. I was talking about you know, martial arts, BJJ, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, those sorts of things. There is a rest and recovery time. We don't go to the gym five days a week, eight and a half hours a day. Da, 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 da. No one does that. I don't think The Rock even does that. And he's huge. Yeah? <laughs> you know, there is still a recovery time that is required to make that happen. Yeah. And that recovery time is time away from tech. Time away from tech. And it's part of the cadence cycle, you know? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there was some sort of play on words of some sort of circadian cadence cycle thing going. I couldn't quite formulate it, but it's there. Look, so a couple of the last things in my head, one of the questions that I'm getting used to asking people is around behavioral change. And we've talked a lot, there's a lot of behavioral change in what we covered here in the last you know, nearly an hour in this. Yeah. How do you make behavioral change stick? You start tiny. 
I don't know if you've heard of BJ Fogg and his tiny habits method. I employ some of that in the work that I do in the mentoring work I do with people. Uh, you have to start small and it has to be something that people identify with and that they can fit into their existing routines quite easily. Because if it's too foreign and it's too big, they won't stick with it. So I think that's how you make behavior change stick. Start small. What was the name of that book again? Tiny Habits. Tiny Habits and who is it by? BJ Fogg. I think I put it here. This is what it looks like. Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much for that. That's huge. My pleasure. Where, thank you very much for this interview. It's been <laughs> phenomenal. I wanted to dive into so many different aspects and bend them in so many different tangents, which is why, you know, partly I love doing this. Where can people find you? So they can check out my website, which is growthsessions.co. And they can find me on social media at Mish Bondesio. That's M-I-C-H-B-O-N-D-E-S-I-O on LinkedIn or Instagram. Wonderful. People listening to this, I highly recommend go and have a conversation. Go and look at this work. Go apply some of the stuff that's been talked about in this conversation, whether it's just from the self-care to the physical distancing to the work stuff that we need to do to build stronger relationships from Mish. Really appreciate the value that's been dropped in it. Really appreciate you, Mish. Thanks very much for this. It's huge. Uh, and I look forward to you guys sharing another interview and, and joining us in the very near future. Thanks very much from Thanks. me. Thank you, Mish. Cheers. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye, Nathan.